Tired of getting crushed every single time you play as the USSR in Axis and Allies 1942 online or at the table? Well, don't worry. It happened to the best of us when we got started. Well, it still happens sometimes. But today we're going to give you a big jump start. We're going to show you five Russian openings as fast as we can. Let's make it hot. Welcome to Board Game Nation. My name is Gary Blevins. Thank you so much for watching. All five of the Russian openings that we're going to cover today will work for both the tabletop and online versions of the game and start with the Larry Harris Gen Con 3.0 setup. If you have no idea what that is, you might want to hold off on this video until you've watched this one right here. When working out strategies, using the low luck dice option is your best bet. It'll give you the closest to average outcomes. So that's what we're going to be using today. For speed and clarity, we're going to be using Beamdog's Access and Allies 1942 online software that's available through Steam, and we're going to move pretty fast. So you may need to pause or back up to look more closely. Also, the bare bones details for each of the openings will be written in the description below for your reference, and you can use the chapter guides to jump around. Before we jump in, let me say that I offer these openings as options. Some are definitely better than others, and we're going to talk about that along the way. Also, stick around. Near the end of the video, I'm going to share some what were you thinking examples. Some I've actually seen in games, and others have been sent in by some of our favorite favorite subscribers. All right, let's go. These are loosely in order from most conservative to most aggressive. Opening number one, the Russian stack. Our first opening is the instinct of a lot of new players that think that Russia is purely a defensive power and play accordingly. They build the meat wall or the fistful of Ivans or the Russian meh, eight infantry. Lots of fun names, but almost always a losing play. Let's go through it. Combat move. The units in West Russia are a must kill for the USSR on turn one, and the more conservative players often abandon the valuable territories around it, thinking that the big stack will be impenetrable and a deterrent for attacks in those surrounding areas. Not so much. Of course, the math is overwhelming for the USSR to take West Russia, but leaving Caucasus and Karelia empty is going to come at a high price. We'll see why in a minute. Non combat. The entire Russian Navy joins the fleet in C Zone 7. Both AA guns move into West Russia to reinforce. It's not going to help. Mobilized units, we've got eight guys to place. They've all got to go into Moscow. Let's recap. Germany can walk into Caucasus and Karelia unopposed, but West Russia is secure. Or is it? What can Germany do? Like the map, all of them. Germany can grab Caucasus with one or two guys using the Med Fleet, attack West Russia with everything. That's 18 units, giving them terrific odds of destroying nearly every Russian offensive unit. And no matter what happens in West Russia, there's no way that the Russians are going to be in any position to challenge the medium-sized stack forming in Karelia. One trade-off for the Germans, though, the math on the attack on C-Zone 7 isn't as strong as I normally like it, and they're going to have to contend with a number of UK naval units down the road. After we rolled out the combat, the Germans got very lucky in C-Zone 7. And in West Russia, they destroyed all of the units, but decided not to trade off the air units for those last few Russian tanks. The combat summary really tells the story. Yes, the Germans losing 78 IPCs of material in turn one is a big deal. But what compared to the 82 IPCs worth for the Russians, this is a great trade for the Axis. How great becomes crystal clear when you consider that the Germans start the game with 332 IPCs worth of material and the Russians only start with 129. The Russians just lost 82 of it. For the rest of the game, the USSR is going to have no meaningful ability to threaten anyone. After non-combat, you can see that before the Germans put down even a single new unit, they're already a huge advantage over the Russians and are within a turn or two of seriously threatening Moscow. So, hyper-conservative play and buying all guys in Russia's turn one? Bad idea. Opening uh, number two. Two bad options. The purchase this time is one tank and six infantry. Still fairly conservative, but it has definite advantages over the purchase in our last example. One quick side note, I'm a big fan of the Larry Harris Gen Con 3.0 setup for the 1942.2 version, but it has one big drawback. The Russian turn one combat move has become rather predictable. There's some variety, but by moving the lone German bomber to Ukraine, it becomes a very tempting target for the Russian units that are in range. This has given rise to what I call the 912 attack. It looks like this. The Russians are going to send everything that can reach to Ukraine. That's a total of nine units. All the remaining units are going to attack West Russia. That's 12 more units, thus the 912 attack. Notice that we've abandoned Karelia. Now, I know that this is a victory city, and it seems counterintuitive to leave it undefended, but trust me, it cannot be helped at this stage of the game. The attack on West Russia is a no-brainer. They have overwhelming odds. However, the battle in Ukraine is a bit different. We want to take out as many of the units as possible without actually taking the territory. Wait, what? Why not? If the Russians take the territory, they'll be required to leave all the surviving units in Ukraine, making them vulnerable to a massive German counterattack. 
Russian offensive units, especially tanks, are exceptionally valuable. So it's better to hit and run or strafe the territory and to live to fight another day. Let's go through what that looks like. Low luck makes this a bit easier to predict what's going to happen. We add up the total attack power of the Russian units, in this case 21, divide that by six. We know that we'll be guaranteed to get three hits in the first round. That leaves us a remainder of three. So we roll one die and we get that fourth hit on a roll of a one, two, or a three. We hit and the Germans have to assign four hits. They take the three infantry and one artillery. Using the same method, they get two hits. Naturally, the Russians lose the two infantry. Now, do we press on or do we retreat? Totaling the Russian attack power, divide that by six, tells us that if we continue, we're going to get three hits and possibly a fourth on a roll of a one. But the Germans only have three units remaining. So if we press the attack, we're going to wipe out the remaining troops. The worst the Germans can do is get two hits, which means that our precious tanks would be stuck in Ukraine with no protection and likely destroyed on Germany's first turn. So the smart play here is to retreat everyone back to Caucasus. Looking at the combat summary, the Russians can feel really good about their better than two to one margin of IPC losses. A pretty straightforward non-combat move. The sub moves over to C-Zone 7, the fighters land in Caucasus, and most of the infantry in Asia has marched west with the exception of the guys who stepped into China to help out the Americans. Also, the AA gun in Moscow moved into West Russia in hopes of taking out the shiny German fighter should they decide to attack. The Russians mobilized the new tank and three infantry in Caucasus and the other three guys in Moscow. Okay, cool, where are the two bad options? Let's look at the German position at the start of their turn. The Russians gave them Karelia for now and they need to attack C-Zone 7. So what about the rest of the land units? Do the Germans attack West Russia or Caucasus? Let's look at the math. Attacking Caucasus with everything means getting there with 10 rather expensive units with zero chance of success. Bad option number one. How about West Russia? Getting there with everything means 14 units with a few infantry that can take the early hits. The math says that it's a 100% chance of success. Well, how is that a bad option? Let's find out. The Germans attack West Russia and success. They did lose a fighter to the AA gun, but they took out all of the enemy units there and took the territory, but wait. Now the German tanks are stuck on the front line alone. After non-combat, you can see that the Russians are gonna easily retake West Russia and pick up Ukraine. So now down a fighter, soon to lose another three tanks, and on their next turn, they're gonna to have to start fighting about Ukraine. Maybe attacking West Russia was just another bad option. Option three would be my choice. What would you have done as Germany in this situation? Let us know in the comments. Russian opening number three, the Russian winter. This opening takes the middle of the road approach or what I call the Russian winter. The play is designed to provide a balance of offensive and defensive power with the goal of buying time for the rest of the allies to get into the fight. Purchase, four infantry, three artillery. For combat, we're gonna use the tried and true 912 attack, the big stack into West Russia and the planned strafe of the Ukraine. Moving into combat, things went really well in West Russia, only losing two infantry. Over to Ukraine. The math holds. This leaves four remaining German units. So should the Germans press on or retreat? We can add up the Russian power and see that we've got a total of 19, meaning three hits for sure, leaving a remainder of only one, so a one in six chance of getting that fourth hit. Remember, the Russians don't want their tanks stranded in the Ukraine, so they only want three hits. Let's see. Not so much. They caught all four. The Germans get their last two hits in, but it doesn't much matter. While the IPC trade looks good for now, the Russians are gonna take a big loss when the Germans counterattack. Non-combat move. Not a lot of surprises here. With the expectation of losing those tanks, the Russians are gonna to need to shore up. So they have the infantry moving across Asia, but they don't want the Japanese to just walk through unopposed. A few brave souls head into China to help defend the American fighter and generally make things stickier for the Japanese. Mobilized units, the Russians wanna get as much offensive material where it can do the most good. So two infantry, two artillery and caucuses, and the rest into Moscow. As for the German options, they have a few, but other than taking out those tanks, nothing's really a slam dunk. They could stack Ukraine, hit it with 18 guys, and destroy those Russian tanks with minimum casualties, but this is what they're left with when Russia turn two comes along. Seven guys and six tanks versus a wall of Russian death just waiting to crush them. No good. They could try to attack West Russia and Ukraine. This isn't great either. Ukraine is a no-brainer, of course, but the battle in West Russia is not good. Worse than a coin flip, and no matter how it goes, it's gonna be stupid expensive for the Germans. That leaves a soft trade option, attacking Ukraine with the minimum necessary to capture it. In this case, that's three fighters and four infantry. With low luck, it'll be over in two rounds and the Germans will have one or two infantry left over to occupy Ukraine. And the air units can head back to their bases. 
Sure, the Russians will be able to take it back on Russia's next turn, but it will be much cheaper for the Germans to take it this way than to try to stack it and hold it for the next turn. Again, why is this called Russian winter? It gives the Russians enough punch to create a no man's land without overextending their offensive units. If you're finding this video helpful, give us a like, consider subscribing to the channel. All the cool kids are doing it. In fact, we just passed 2,000 subscribers and we couldn't be more grateful for the support. More videos about access and allies, strategy, and tactics are on the way. Option number four, Yak, party of three. Purchase four infantry and one fighter. The first time I saw this, I did a double take. What, Russian air power on turn one? You must have fallen and hit your head on something. Turns out I was the one that needed to have my head examined. Follow this purchase up with the good old 912 attack. We roll into West Russia with no problem. Let's see how we do this time in Ukraine. First round, only three hits. Sounds weird, but that's actually better. Germans get the usual two hits. Second round of combat, three hits. Perfect, we got the tank, the fighter, and they only got one hit in return. We know if we press on here, we're gonna lose the artillery and three tanks. So we leave the bomber alone and retreat. Another quick note, on the defense on turn one against Russian attacks, a lot of players will choose to lose the bomber rather than the fighter, even though it's the more expensive unit. Sometimes they'll even choose to lose the bomber in the first round. Why? Two reasons. First, if the Russians are trying to get the bomber, they may retreat after the first round of combat if it's destroyed rather than to stick around and try to take out the tank and the fighter. Second, and more practically, the fighter defends at a four, the bomber at a one. If you're gonna die anyway, you might as well give yourself the best chance of taking someone with you, right? The default in the beam dog system is to lose the bomber last. Something to think about. Let's get back to the example. I think this is just about the best possible low luck outcome that this battle can have for the Russians. Same basic non-combat moves as before, but this time we're gonna land two Russian fighters in Archangel. This is gonna do two things for us. These fighters put pressure on C-Zone 5. This acts as a deterrent against the Germans making a significant purchase of sea units. Next, from Archangel, the fighters can reach Buratia in the event that the Japanese decide to make a push north. This is also a good setup for a possible Kill Japan first game, but that's another video. After non-combat and the new fighter is placed in Caucasus, you can see that there's no way the Germans could attack Caucasus. And if they try to make the big swing at West Russia, there's more than enough firepower to take it right back. All that's great, but the biggest advantage of the Russian opening fighter purchase is the flexibility in the middle and end game. Being able to send two infantry and a fighter to pick off a single unit without putting a fighter in danger becomes incredibly handy down the road. Also, when Germany does come knocking on the door in Moscow, and they will, the fighter is gonna give the best possible defense. I probably shouldn't say this in a video that's gonna go out to everybody, but at the moment, this is my preferred Russian opening. Interesting. Option number five, Russia 30. Okay, so what is the most aggressive Russian opening that makes any sense at all? Here we go. Purchase four infantry and one bomber. Yes, the dreaded Russian bomber. Okay, before we go any further, I have to say that this is my favorite molded unit in the game. I have no idea if it's accurate in any way, but it's huge and I love it. Anyway, combat moves for this very aggressive Russian opening are gonna involve attacking three territories instead of just the two from the 912 attack. This will spread the Russian wall much thinner, but they should still be heavily favored in all the battles. With an attack on West Russia with nine units, eight units in the Ukraine and four in the Baltic, the Russians can make a clean sweep and take out a lot of the Germans' most important offensive units right at the top of the game. Using low luck, this strategy should end up with a final tally that looks something like this. Pretty sweet. Two to one advantage for the mad Russians. But how does this leave them? After non-combat and placing that mighty bomber, Russia now has an attack power of 41, down from a starting attack power of 47. Not a great sign, and the Germans are about to play cleanup. They can swing a big stack into the Baltic and squish that lonely tank in Ukraine with no problem, along with picking up Karelia for free. The Germans can also make a strong attack in Transjordan with the battleship and transport in the Med. They don't have a meaningful chance at West Russia, but that giant stack at the Baltic is likely heading into Moscow on Germany's fourth or fifth turn. Something to note here, the beam dog in-game battle calculator needs some work. The Transjordan fight's a good example. It lists the chances of success in this battle as improbable, but three different battle calculators and common sense tells us that the battle's got about a 90% chance of victory. I'm not sure what the issue is here. Is there a bug that's being worked on? If you know anything about it or have an explanation, let me know in the comments. Back to the battle. So the Russians now have a southern problem and the Germans have formed a gigantic force in the Baltic that's only gonna get bigger as it approaches Moscow. 
the Russian bomber will be good for helping the infantry trade off nearby territories with German invaders, but it'll be useless when it comes time to defend Moscow. The 30 IPCs that the Russians collected is definitely going to help, but will it be enough? I doubt it. This isn't the worst opening that we've covered today, but it certainly is a high wire act. One wrong move with this opening will certainly spell disaster. It's worth noting that the bomber purchase doesn't necessarily need to be paired with this set of combat moves. You could use any of the purchase combinations that we've talked about today. If you wanted to run the Russia 30 opening, what would you purchase to see the Russians through to victory? Let us know in the comments. Finally, as promised, here are a few of the worst Russian openings I have ever seen. What? H how did you think that was going to work out? Okay, sure, a, a Russian med fleet? How'd that go? You know, you could just pull all your guys out of Moscow entirely. I mean, why not? I'm sure the Germans won't use all that money to take over the world. Comrade? Why? Just, just why? We have got so much coming up in 2022 that we can't wait to share. You can join us by clicking that subscribe button and joining Board Game Nation. My name is Gary Blevins. This is Board Game Nation. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time.